Hi everyone, Stefano here from Sonic Cinema. Welcome to a brand new episode of Behind the Music. Today I'm incredibly excited to be speaking with composer extraordinaire David Buckley. You may know David's music from hit TV shows such as The Sandman, The Good Fight, The Good Wife and many of the finest films and television dramas in recent years. Today we'll be discussing his life, his composing process on The Sandman, collaboration with Hans Zimmer, Harry Gregson Williams and Danny Elfman, relationship with tech and virtual instruments and a lot more. Hey David. Hey, hey Stefano, how are you doing? Thank you so much for joining me today. No, not at all. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. I wanted to ask you, like, uh, you know, about your journey, because, I mean, you're such an incredibly successful composer, and, you know, I think it would be inspiring for everybody, and also interesting to, have, to hear where you started from, how you ended up now, with, you know, Emmy-nominated, hundreds of TV episodes under your belt, multimedia Dora films, collaboration with, I don't know, Hans Zimmer, Rex Williams, and Danny Elfman, and, you know, a lot more. Uh, well, I'm a, I guess I'm a lucky bastard. That's one thing I'd say. <laughs> um, but I mean, well, my musical journey, well, funny enough, it began here in this very city. I went to nice. I went I went to school here, and just a two minute walk out of my front door is is a, a cathedral, big big church where I used to, I sang as a mm. choir boy, and by sort of a bizarre you know, turn of fate, just briefly when I was singing there so I was probably age nine to 14 um and then for one of those years I can't remember which one a young guy came into the choir sang for a couple of terms his name was Harry Gregson Williams um so this was before Harry was doing big blockbuster movies this was I think he sort of left college he graduated he was trying to figure out what to do and he I think he'd done some traveling in Egypt or was about to and um so I met, I didn't, you know, I, sensibly I was a kid, well not sensibly, I was a kid and Harry was an adult. So, you know, we weren't peer level or anything like that, but mm. um, I I just was aware of him as this singer. And I think many, 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 many years later, I saw his name on the, on the end of a movie. I thought, what the hell? Last time I was aware of you, you were singing in this damn church and now look at you. Um, so, you know, that was one thing that sort of, that doesn't to say that therefore I wanted to do that. I'm just saying that I did have this fortunate, very fortunate bit of um, contact, you know, between. So you remembered you after so many years. Yeah, 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 yeah. When, well, <clears throat> the, the, the other two parts of the, of the story where I did get the real taste for it was again, all of these things happened from this choir. The other, the one where I thought, oh, film music, this is cool, was we, th this, you said you've been to Bath, well, we're quite near Peter Gabriel's studio in real world. Um, oh, right, yeah. we're I mean, there's other cathedral choirs nearby, but we're, we're not that far. He was scoring back in 1988, I guess, The Last Temptation of Christ, the mm. um, Martin Scorsese film. And... I don't know whether he went to other choirs first or whatever, but ultimately we were the ones who ended up performing some of the some of the choral bits on it, and that was fascinating. Like because I was you know ten or ten or eleven, and everything had beat my sort of musical experience in this choir it was very regimented. You know, you sing a service every day, you practice for it. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say the music was all the same, but it was all. Yeah. yeah, church music. Quite a commitment sense. every day as well. It is a commitment. Um, it is a huge commitment. And in some ways, I think it's, it's you know, there's a number of ex-cathedral choristers who've become film composers. I think I think the sort of discipline that, um, you know, basically being in this sort of collaborative group seven days a week, mm. including Christmas and not being with your family at certain times where other, other people would be. It's sort of like, yeah, that's that's... The same thing often as you know when when you <laughs> when you're writing for media. So, um, but I loved that moment when with I loved singing on that score um, because it was just like an eye opener. It's like, geez, music. Well, this isn't this is so right. different to what I do, and it's and it's music plus something else. It's not just right. music. It's okay. It's a, so before then, you like weren't really interested in film music or any. Of no, I don't think so. No, I, I don't oh. think I knew. I don't think I knew. You know, it's funny when I see the odd interview given by, you know, someone else who does what we do, and and 
they often talk about sort of John Williams being in Star Wars being where it all began mm. for them. Yeah, yeah, all I hear all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be one of the sort of stock stock phrases, which I, I'm not saying people are cheesy and cliched. It just obviously goes to show that John Williams has is, is, is been a yeah. huge inspiration for many. But I remember very clearly the first time I watched a Star Wars movie, um, I painstakingly sat down with the video recorder and I kept pausing it like every five seconds. I wanted to write the dialogue out. I can remember just sitting there, just trying to get the whole script. I think I gave up after about five minutes. <laughs> yeah. so five minutes yeah, it's and I, so, so what ends, I, I don't know why I wanted to do that. And I had it in mind to not just, you know, there was three more movies at the time that I thought I needed to do this to. So, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think John Williams is absolutely amazing. And obviously he's held, you know, the spot, the, the, the very highest spot in, in the industry for so long. Yeah. Um, but um, it wasn't, I didn't hear that and think, oh, I want to do that, or you know, I can do that. Um, but the, but the, and then the third thing, again, in this bloody choir I keep talking about, um, <laughs> there was, a, um, we were asked to sing a piece of music. It wasn't film score, but it was, um, it had a very cinematic kind of feel to it by a guy called Richard Harvey, um, who's mm. a British, British composer, and yeah, incredible musician as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. He's not. He, he, I mean, he writes amazingly, but he's um, he can play anything. pretty much anything. <laughs> I mean, I, so he he became as he became a sort of my first mentor, really, and he really helped really? me right. sort of get. He he helped me get to LA and to make reconnect with Harry because. Harry had worked for him, and Richard is still a really dear friend. In fact, we're just exchanging emails prior to this because we're, we're recording some choral music in two weeks in uh, Estonia. We're doing an album together, and Richard played on the Sandman for me, and he sort of looked out for me over the years, and um, and just sort of been a continual source of encouragement. So yeah, I mean, all these, you know, in in a sense, it's a frustrating answer for, especially for like a you know a young person who's yeah. Because they think, oh well, lucky you then. You 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 were in the right place at the right time, and I can't really <coughs> I can't really sugarcoat that and say yes, I kind of was in the right place at the right time. But what I often say is, when people what what I like to add to that though is that I think yeah that you never quite know when an opportunity will lead to something yeah. um, beyond what you may have expected. Because I assure as hell when my parents you know, enrolled me in that choir and I joined up. It wasn't because I thought, great, this is my way into film music. Yeah, didn't, yeah of course. I didn't, I didn't even know what bloody film music was. Um, what it was, it was my way into a, a musical environment, which I loved. And one thing led to another. And I, that's what I think is really important. But when I when I talk to, you know, do a talk at a college or school yeah. or something like that, I, I, I'm a real believer that, like if if you've got if you love music, <clears throat> and you can just be in, participate, at whatever yeah. level, I'm almost certain you will. You know, we're not all going to be the greatest cellist in the world, the greatest composer in the world, the greatest whatever. But I do think that if we can find our mo our space within the musical world, and I do think, and we and we and we have commitment, and we persevere, and we're we know how to talk to people. We're likable. I, I do think that you know good things will will, will potentially come our way. I can't, I can't guarantee, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. So then, how did you go on on uh, meet Richard Harvey, which seems like a key figure here, like on connecting so, all the dots, basically? Well, because I'd sung in this piece again, you know, adult. I he was in the involved in the piece with uh, he, Peter Gabriel. No, no, he wrote this piece of music called "The Plague and the oh, Moon." Oh, right. I see. It was okay. a big. It was, written in around 89 or 90 and it's a it's a sort of an eco oratorio um and it, you know it was all about how we're destroying the amazon rainforests and the world's gonna end and it's like okay yeah that was back in 1990 and still no one's listening um <laughs> so it was a big um big kind of politically nuanced piece of music but also um you know, it had everything, it had orchestra, it had synths, it had Richard playing pan pipes, it had ethnic guys playing charangos mm. and this, that, and the other, had huge visuals on the up on the screen. We did it in St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, so yeah, it was like it was a again, rather like the last of Christ, a massive eye turner for me. So 
different to what I was doing on a daily basis. And that was sort of the end of it until I left. I think I graduated from university <coughs> with a music degree, which of course begs the question, what the hell do I do now? Because, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. great, I've got a degree in music. <laughs> um, show me where the benefits office is so I can sign up. But, um, you know, I did everything in that year, in that decade after I graduated, I taught, I wrote music for toilet roll commercials, I sang, I edited music, I do, you know, I remember once someone said, oh, there's a string quartet concert in, I think, in the Wigmore Hall, their page, oh, nice. to the page turner has can't, got ill, can you turn pages, we'll give you like 50 quid, yeah, I'll do it, don't worry, I mean, I just thought, if someone's paying me to do something that is musical related, I'll do it, because I just think that's, you know, yeah. Tough. So, so you know that there's a dream of people's to, to to learn earn a living from from the music um and at that time you know amongst all these bits and bobs i was doing all over london i mean if i was if i found one of my diaries from i, I don't keep a diary anymore but I, I i did for a while there and just you know i was like literally singing in like a church in the morning then going to a school to teach a lesson in the afternoon then um, playing jazz piano at a, at a kind of function in the evening and you know it was just not, none of it was particularly highbrow I mean, I'm, not, I'm not claiming I'm a like um, you know this insane musician who could do anything I, it was just that I did have this varied musical lifestyle and, and it gave me I suppose enough confidence that I just dropped Richard a little email and I said you know when I was a kid I sang on your piece and I absolutely loved it um, and he said oh why don't you know come over and we got on kind of straight away and you know fantastic and then and again, yeah f from then on yeah. you wanted okay film music like it's where I want to be like well Richard was very clear with me that because I'd done this stuff in London and um you know lots of commercials and television some sort of really low-end television music um like reality tv shows and stuff like that and he said um, he said, you know, if you want to make a go at this, you need to basically pack your bags and get over to LA. Mm. Um, he's, and that was like 20 years ago, like something that was like in that? 2000, 2005, 2006. Okay. So not, okay, less than 50, sort of, yeah. Yeah, okay. 50, yeah, about 15 years ago. He okay. said, you know, you, yeah. And, you know, I think the world was very different back then i think it's obviously the, the coronavirus has changed i don't know it'd be curious yeah. to know if he thinks not that you know i'm only richard is a, yeah. a, a fountain but there are other fountain wisdom out there but i don't know now if, if if i were to if someone were to say to me you know i want to get i want to do great movies or score or whatever yeah I, I don't know if i would say right you've got to get to la i'm not sure mm. um i haven't not I mean, I certainly wouldn't say don't do it, but I'm not sure the imperative that Richard said, you know, that this is yeah, basically... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for a start, I certainly noticed that in my absence from the UK that I began to notice that the, the film industry was really starting to blossom over mm. here. Um, and obviously television, there's incredible content happening everywhere now. Um, so, yeah. Um, th but that was certainly by then that was my impetus he said you should go and I did and I I, I sort of he, he was working on something he said why don't you come over when I'm working on something over there and I he sort of introduced me to Hans and reintroduced me to Harry and then nothing sort of happened really all, I mean I took you know I did that trip that yeah. so many people have done which is oh, going okay. to LA and then I sort of came back to England thinking well you know I went and said hello and what, what what can I do? I'm not going to like I'm not going to beg someone. Um, and then yeah. by good fortune, Harry emailed me and said, "You know what? I am quite busy. I, I can see a pretty nasty spot coming up in a, in a month. Why don't you get your stuff together and come over and do a sort of three month trial?" And then, fifteen years later, I was still in LA. I finished my trial, but. Yeah, it's so like was... a dream. You know, the really inspiring stories you hear, you know, on, on you know, you're reading books and something like. But you know, that's I think I, my what I think now, and this is like for people watching, like you know, as you say, people graduating, like how do I approach these, you know, big names? Is that actually possible? Is it like because I think for you there was a connection with Richard Harvey because you sang in a choir, so it wasn't you weren't like a stranger. I mean, well, there was this nice thing of, you know, as yeah. a kid. Yeah, it's difficult because. You know, sometimes people send 
emails and say, how, they, some, you know, I've been sent emails saying, how can I get in touch with such and such? Now, obviously, mm. I, I've, I've got, you know, I know a lot of these people at, at some level. Um, I'm not saying that they're, you know, my best buddies or anything, but but there's been professional <clears throat> reasons to sort of know Hans Zimmer, for example. Um, yeah. I, so if someone says, you know, how can I get Hans Zimmer's email? Obviously, I could probably say, oh, I can give it to you, but obviously, I'm, I'm not going to do that because yeah, of Hans, course. Hans would obviously irritate Hans. And secondly, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily help you. Um, it, yeah. You need to think, like, it's such a difficult one. And obviously, I do feel this sense of, I'm not going to say guilt because I'm getting too mm. old to feel guilt. About things I shouldn't feel guilty for. I'm fully aware that that I I had this good fortune that that you know I just these stars align whatever it is and I met Richard and I met Harry. So I ha always so rather than going to these people cold and just saying hey I'm a film goes I want a job which they must you know people that's a mm. too that e email is written too often. I was lucky that I had this shared background. So it makes that opening sentence so much easier so much yeah. easier for them to read and not just saying oh god here we go again and what what can one do if one doesn't have that you can't you can't contrive something you can't you can't invent something um what it possibly means is that one really needs to think especially for people who want to go and work for another composer you know be an apprentice learn their craft yeah. that way as i did um i think it means you probably just have to really search for the right for the person who has the best possible that feel you know almost the most equivalent version of what I've just described that we sang in a choir together. Now, the chances are you're not gonna you know you don't you didn't play in a football team with um, I don't know Chris Beck and you didn't play rugby with John Powell. So I mean, it's the, the chances yeah. are not high that you do. So I just think I tell, one thing I do know is when I get sent an email and and someone asks. A question and I feel that they've written this to like a hundred other people and then yeah. I just get this huge sense of, of copy and paste email copy yeah. and paste no kind of no reference to the fact that you're basically asking me for my time and of which I'm I I am always I'm not always but I try and give that time but I'm more inclined to do it in fact nowadays I'm sort of set I kind of set a little rule book myself that if there's no sense of a personal connection like you know they may just say, oh I, I heard this score and yeah. I love this track or I was or or you know I was really interested because of something or other yeah. choir or then I'm thinking okay well you've caught me a little bit you 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 haven't you, yeah. you've you've engaged with me not with just this profession and I think that yeah. if you haven't got the, you know some kind of weird interaction with someone from something that happened in the past which let's assume that most people don't then I do think the best way to reach people is to give someone a sense that you, and and try and make it serious and genuine as well that you really do care about their music and you and it is not just about you begging for a job but it's also especially if you're trying to get one of these sort of assistant roles or additional music I mean let them know that you want to do something you love their music and that you feel that you can help them. Not yeah. Sometimes it reads really badly when people write messages, and it and it appears that it's all about the a established composer helping the new guy. That's not what composers, yeah. film composers, are here for. They're not here to launch yeah, the careers of the next generation. It happens. Um, it's it's a very difficult. There's no textbook or there's no music college or I you know that can yeah. thoroughly explain. Um, how to go about any of this um it's 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 very very tricky and and i and the other thing i'd say is as well is that of course we're talking about one avenue here we're talking about going into the business via you know the audiences yeah. of someone else i mean let's but also forget especially now in a day of <clears throat> youtube and internet and social media that there are some people who have been discovered and have sort of just become a thing unto themselves. They haven't required to go into, you know, someone else's camp. I mean, I, I'm yeah. sure that I'm sure my one of my ex agents mentioned to me that um, they discovered a couple of people like who just done some fantastic thing that they sort of done and put on YouTube and it got millions of hits and they just thought, oh God, this person's got entrepreneurial chops. Yeah. So, 
I mean, again, not easy. By no means is that something yeah. that's easy. But I don't yeah. think the additional music thing is not for everyone. That's one thing. I've got okay. To yeah, that, I think that's an important point. I think because maybe people think, okay, I'm gonna wear additional music, but you have to adapt your style to someone else. You have to adapt your style, and you might not like it. You might not be able to. You might not know that line because when you're doing that additional music thing, you know there'd be a line where you have to think, am I? Am I literally just like an extra hand? Well, not literally, metaphorically, an extra hand. Yeah, a pair of hands of these of this composer, or can I give it a little bit of my personality? The other thing I need you to be aware of is just because you do some additional music for someone, it doesn't guarantee you a career either. Um, and I certainly know there was a time where people just thought, well, you know, if I go and right help someone out in this movie they're going to offer me a film in return i mean no there's no i mean you, obviously people make whatever agreements they want with anyone but it's yeah. not it's not written in, in the tablet that, that this is what will happen and i think there are some misconceptions about that i mean it's I, you know i've seen people thrive doing the additional music thing i think broadly mm. speaking i thrived and it benefited me but i've also seen some people sink or get not stuck return. there like maybe like or they get stuck yeah. And I'll tell you another thing that's difficult about it is when, when you want to break free from it, it sometimes people, when I say people, I mean like executives, music people, producers, they they might they may look you up and think, well, hold on, he's just he works for that guy. What we, we want we want a guy. We don't want the guy who works for the guy. So it can yeah. it can it can kind of backfire. I de I definitely I think after I when I sort of stopped working for Harry and did my own stuff. I was I, I got a few movies, but I remember going for meetings for other movies. And this question was coming up. It's like, yeah, but hold on, but you're you're Harry's guy, aren't you? I was like, no, I'm me. I'm standing here in front of you. I'm, I'm I, I can speak for myself. I've spent quite a lot of time, and this is not um me being ungrateful or anything like that. Um it's just you know fighting to sort of be regarded as my own entity rather than an extension of someone else. And of course the extension of someone else paid, it was good for me at a time because that was all I had going. So again, these are all, these are all incredibly tricky things of, of which my opinion is only one that other people might may passionately disagree with me. Um, yeah. But but I was, if there's a universal truth to any of these things is that there is no hard and fast rules for, for this stuff. Okay. I think. Yeah. I, I would have thought like working for, you know, Harry Greg Hans Zimmer would be will give, you know, the exact, you know, okay, I trust this guy because he worked with them. He knows what's the procedure. So but you tell me that, you know, you kind of follow the your mentor names follows you for a bit. It can it could definitely follow you. I but you're right. I think I think it can give you some credibility. And obviously my, my first couple of movies, I mean I, I literally had Harry as a score producer. So he was basically All there right. to tell. I guarantee you. Know, it, got, uh, yeah. yeah, that he will finish it on time, on budget, and it will sound good. Um, and so that was literally a case of him, of him sort of putting his seal of approval, which I think certainly with one of the first movies I did, I don't think I would have got the film without that. Okay. I, just I, didn't, I didn't have any credits, so to speak of. I just didn't have any profile. So I was at that point, I was latching onto every bit of blood that, that Harry would <laughs> because it was there was no other other way around it. Yeah, and yeah. and then, but of course, you know, prior to even another good thing about if one can find an apprenticeship or you know, one of these studios with more of a team approach, one of the good things about those <coughs> scenarios, or whether it's just yeah, what, what, whatever is working for for another person who's got some more experience than you is that it's not just the musical things that you pick up. Um, I mean, in fact, I don't necessarily. Well, no, that's not true. I think I did. I did learn lots of little musical tricks and things, but it, it, it's the politics. It's seeing how mm. Hans talks to a director, how Harry, you know, deals with a tricky situation with a something or other. That's priceless. That is priceless. And again, I, I, you know, I don't want to say therefore you should go and do it because 
not it's, it's sort of unfeasible for everyone out there to go and do it because there's lots of people trying to do this so i'm just trying to point out because we're talking about pros and cons here and and pluses and minuses yeah. that that being able to whether it was with you know any of the like john powell harry whoever it was just it's fascinating danny it's just fascinating to just sort of be a fly on the wall and see oh wow that's how you get over that situation oh that's what you do there um it's yeah that because as, as people famously say about this business the ability to write the music is 50 percent the, the other 50 percent is all the um the politics the um knowing when to say something when to keep your mouth shut um yeah being, being a therapist i mean i've had a director on the phone but to me once quite a big move relatively big movie and the director was sort of saying I just don't know what to do. I don't know if I can carry on. You know, and like it's like really? Jesus. Really? Wow. Yeah. And, and this wasn't this wasn't a musical. You hadn't just listened to my music and said, I don't think I could. It was this was in fact we'd finished the, the score at this point. And um it's great that you know you consider it almost like a friend, like it's mutual yeah, trust I mean, to open up uh, you know. Well, I think certainly in the moment there was this mutual trust and he he opened up to me. We don't we don't I don't really know what he's doing today or or, or, or have that you know it's not like it's not like it's not like we've built a bond off of that I think just in the moment um and I think that's fine because this is you know we're in a business I'm not in a you know I'm not not setting up a sort of clinic um <laughs> for fast directors but um but um but I do think that's but that's fine that's good though if I I mean it's a it's a form of collaboration um I don't think it will do me any harm. I mean, you know, in terms of this, if, if this guy, I mean, he might call me again for whatever. Um, but it's just, I think the point is that you, one needs to, I've seen many, not many, I've seen a number of excellent composers not get as far as they ought to because they don't have the non-compositional things up to speed. Right. They're yeah. lacking yeah, yeah. quite yeah. significantly in, in, in areas which, um, they need, yeah, you just need to get your game up on, on this other yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, be a team player, don't be a dick, yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's all, you know, and knowing how far to, to, to you know, how chummy to be, how not, you know, how how you shouldn't be so chummy, you know, it's it's reading a yeah, room. Yeah. Um, reading the room, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and all these things are not, you can't really mug up, you can't, you can't look at a YouTube, I mean, I know there's now all sorts of masterclass and stuff like that, which I've never seen any of them, but, um, I don't think a lot of the stuff I'm talking about you can like practice. Uh, well, you can practice it. You have to yeah. practice it in the moment. And yeah. but I say, like, you know, when I when I going back to my first like my decade of sort of being a, out in the world after I left university. I mean, I did every possible short film that I could get my hands on. I went round all the sort of film schools in London um, and just said, you know, I'll write your score. I think we put little little thing. Could just peel it off and it, you know i'll write your score for four pack of beer and i, th I think that was my best fee actually um in the, in the end <laughs> four, four tins of heineken um and but the great thing about that was that you know young young director young composer we're making our mistakes together figuring stuff out um yeah. I'm, I'm a huge huge believer in in you know if, if, if this is going to get some some um uh interaction from people who are just starting their careers out i would be total advocate of saying go out and try and find short films to do um and one of those people who make short films is almost certainly going to go out and make a longer film and yeah, yeah um, definitely and make a yeah. Feature film. And it's much easier to start a creative collaboration with someone when you're both starting together and, and going you know in the trenches that it is you know, if I yeah. try to get in touch with Christopher Nolan now to score a movie, it'd be kind of awkward. Um, whereas, you know, if I try to, well, I guess I'm not, I don't need to try now as much because I'm in a slightly different position, but you know what I mean? There's something organic about Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I will add, maybe also don't underestimate editors and sound designers, like starting out, you know, editors especially, you know, they, they are the ones who play music. and Absolutely, absolutely. No, I mean... I can think of a few projects where the, the editors or the music editors said, oh, can you send us some tracks? And they put, you know, when they're temping and I put it in there and and it's, I got a phone call and in a few instances it turned into a gig. So, yeah, I mean, 
you're absolutely right yeah yeah i mean that goes back almost to my point about you don't you don't quite you can never really predict you know yeah yeah but some unlikely shitty project that you do i mean i think you i think that's a part that there has to be always an element of gamble with what we do as well that yeah you may look at something you might you, someone may send you like can you do this thing you know, whatever it is a commercial tv an episode of a show whatever and you might look at the oh you know it's not it's not really what i want to do but you have to look slightly beyond that as well and think okay well this one isn't the one that necessarily ticks as many boxes i'd like but i think my sense is that there could be something after this and I, my sense is that could be mm. better of course you don't know there's it's intuition um and you could well be wrong mm. um but if you if there's something kind of slightly keeping you awake at night that that this could lead somewhere even if the, the current thing isn't so great then then again you've got to factor that into your into your existence i mean yeah. i certainly <coughs> had a philosophy for the for the longest time which is I'll, I'll try and say yes to everything that i can Mm. I really hated saying no to something because I I just hate, you know it's that freelance thing of thinking yeah oh, I say no you to never it. know when the next gig might come in so yeah I might yeah and maybe yes that one I said, and the one I said no to could have been the one that branched out into something insane yeah, yeah, definitely. oh yeah. yeah so many holidays you know pack mic small keyboard and hard drives you know you never know like what might exactly. come when yeah. It's and it's all difficult stuff because again, I mean, it's just it's the same old thing. You can't, there's no, you know, it's not for the faint hearted. I mean, I suppose more careers are, are unpredictable today than they used to be. I guess people are, you know, the world seems all a little bit crazy, but there certainly was a time I felt where, you know, you could enter certain pro pro professions and work your way up and you know where you're going to yeah. be in 10 years and how much you're going to be earning, what sort of mortgage you could afford. I do. I think our business is so much harder to predict, and um, yeah, it's. I think it. Yeah, I just think that, that that's a. Well, there are many other. Too sides many, of yeah, too many things to consider. You know, competition, people working for free, undercutting other sectors. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's a. Uh, and now everybody with a laptop, you know, can pretty. There's so many free instruments as well. You know, yeah, sound yeah. good. So you you really need a laptop, and with free instruments, you can create something decent i think probably if you got that seems that way, yeah. as uh and zimmer said in the mass class you know with the kid in the bronx with the ipad you know it can make a face <laughs> go up. yeah well it's kind of, i mean it's you know there's pros and there's pros and cons all this uh, i mean it's kind of great that anyone could kind of do anything yeah um what but what you need though is you you'd still need a sort of layer of um I don't know, someone who really understands, I mean, the amount of times I, not the amount, it sounds like it's happened often, but I have a, a number of instances, I've expressed an interest about a project to my agent. And I said, oh, no, no, he's he's getting his, his, like, his son or his brother or his nephew or his, and I said, oh, really? So is his son, brother or nephew a composer? No, well, no, but he's, you know, he does some beat or something like that. Oh, and gosh. You're, <laughs> and you're just waiting for the news that it, you know, they persevered, they did their best, and now it's like, okay, now we actually need to find a, you know, someone who really knows how to write. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so yeah, I mean, it's it's fine, it's good, it's good that you can pick up an iPad and you can do this, but I still, I still think there's a discipline to this. I don't, I don't believe, yeah, yeah. I don't believe this is an easy profession. I think, yeah, probably anyone could go to a keyboard, hold down a note, and get a cool loop playing, but I'd like to think that both the executive levels and the producers and also the audience would yeah. notice a difference. I'd love to think that they notice a difference. Yeah. You, you can make the score for the Sandman like that. <laughs> well, if there was something I could press a button and it would got the score done, I would have, it would have been quite nice. But <laughs> Yeah, well, so, I mean, yeah, sliding into that, wow. To say I love the Sandman was like an understatement. I watched the first episode so far and I'm like, oh, this is good. Like the intro with the music, like, gosh, how did you make the music? It's so, so good. Like how, how was, yeah, the process, like you get, how did you get involved? Like, you know, challenges you faced, how you overcame them? Um, well, lots of, lots of challenges. I seem, seem to remember. Um, 
I mean, I think one of going back to our conversation about music editors and and yeah. editors and stuff like that. So prior to this show hiring a composer, as is, as you know, as is the convention, they're going to be putting temp tracks in and seeing, you know, for their early edits when they need to play it to studios and stuff, they can't just, especially with all the visual effects missing, yeah. there's no way you can play this stuff without some kind of music on there. It'd be absolutely yeah. unwatchable. Um, yeah. I mean, that's no disrespect to the drama, by the way. It's just, it's, it's no, made, you know, if you're in that sort of magical kind of realm or uh, yeah. non-reality driven drama, tends to rely on music, tends to rely on visual effects. If you don't have your visual effects in place, which you're not going to uh, till the very end, then you're going <clears> to <throat> need to put some temp score in. And they were putting the music editors who I knew, because we worked on a project together, I mean, they weren't trying to fill it up with me, but because they worked with me, there were some scores that they thought, oh, I know that does the trick there, or I know that does the trick there. Now, you've only seen the first episode, um, yeah. it's pretty wide ranging dramatically so I'm not going to give any yeah, spoilers yeah. away to you there's but... a trailer at the end it seems like to get so much more complicated than I could ever imagine like with the, the other stories like yeah it's really kind of rich and textured and yeah. someone described the first season to me as, as basically being like seven pilot shows for, for rather than just mm. like doing your pilot and then doing nine episodes it's like Pilot, 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 pilot. So they've all got a sort of almost like a fresh start. Here we here we are in a different oh, scenario. Amazing. Obviously, with similar, you know, with with characters that habit um, habitate these episodes, but it, it's way more sectionalized than, than I'm accustomed to in, in a television show, both oh, as a okay. both as a composer and as a and as a viewer. Um, although by the end of the season, it settles into a little bit more of a um, longer kind of form i think the last yeah. four episodes feel that they're more okay. the, 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 um, the, do the themes the, the, like sort of glue them together in a way like <laughs> yeah i mean so because of that and i think you know when you see it you'll know you'll, you'll kind of understand what, what what i'm what i'm referring to the because it's quite disparate at the beginning and we're, and we're moving around yes you know there is obviously the sandman morpheus his theme is I would say fairly omnipresent. I mean, because he's yeah. fairly omnipresent. There's a few episodes where he's probably possibly not in it as much, but um and, like, and then at that point, it's like any kind of theme and variation scenario. If you've got a theme that that symbolizes this character, you can take that theme and you can make it fun in in you know some kind of adrenaline scene, or or you can make it sad in some kind of mourn mournful scene. So from that point of view. It's not that, you know, the, the challenge is no different really to perhaps to any other kind of situation in the film where you need to mutate your theme to, to, to be, you know, numerous different things. I think it's just, it just was a bit heightened in this situation because it was so, we're moving around so much into different scenarios. Okay. And, you know, and the process was, well, the beginning of it was, Beginning of it was just sort of like I, I recall it being quite challenging because even though they had this temporary music in there or whatever, it wasn't like anyone was saying that's that's that, do do that. It was like that, like, yeah, thank God no one was saying that. They were saying Yeah, this, what, what, what was it your music or someone else's? Some of it was mine. I'd say there was, you know, about twenty-five percent of it was was possibly mine. But I didn't actually I didn't yeah. finish the thought. So so <clears throat> What I think they they realize they put this temporary music in, and I suppose at some point you, they have to have a conversation. Okay, well, who are we going to get to score this damn thing? And I think what they had noticed was that <clears throat> you know I it, from the temporary tracks they put in, you know there may have been a horror cue from a film I'd done. There was a more romantic driven cue, sort of sparse piano cue. In other words, they were any number of composers may have had some temporary music in there but i think i was ticking a few boxes just because they were i i i was they seemed to lay in stuff from multiple genres which i've covered and i think that probably just meant they thought oh well as this is a complex show and we're not just horror and we're not just fantasy and we're not just drama we are straddling lots of different kind of things um I think that's why I got got a call to have a chat with them, um, and yeah, that I mean, I th I think that's sort of where, where I kind of came onto their radar. 
you know, had I just had they just tempted in like ten horror cues of mine at any given moment, mm. yeah, I, I wonder if I would have ha had the same kind yeah, of right. response. Yeah. I think it's because I think it's because of that diversity in in, yeah. in the track that, that, that I think that uh, helped. Yeah. yeah. Did you know the the Sandman before? Like uh, you sort of like okay, I'm gonna read about it. Like because I think it's a it's a comic, isn't it? Yeah, it's a comic, which I didn't know. I hadn't read the comics. Um, and I started to read them when I started the gig and started to try and familiarise myself with... I heard the series is better, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably just different. I mean, yeah. you know, it's 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 funny with something like this, and I only really became aware of this properly sort of just like a week before the show came out. So like, you know, only two weeks ago. And I'm kind of glad I didn't come aware of what I'm about to say, which is that there's a quite a fervent fan base for the, you know, people who've read the comics and yeah. people who waited decades for this thing to be done. Oh, to really? Oh, wow. Yeah. And when you start becoming aware of that and then also reading how passionate people are about it, you kind of think, oh, You're boy. scared. Okay, I don't want yeah. to piss anybody off. Yeah, you don't want to piss someone off because, you know, they've obviously got an idea in their head of what of what, of what everything should be, what colour the actor should be, what gender the actor should be. That yeah, seems yeah. a good thing. And, of course, music as well. Um, and I'm glad I only really caught wind of this... Um, this idea, you know, this 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 passion coming from these people after I'd written it, and you know, by, by which point I couldn't, you know, too late. It's all done. If you don't like it, you don't like it, sort of thing. Yeah. I think the worst thing, if I sort of, I think if I was aware of that, well, I, I think it would have made what was already quite a daunting task even more. Oh, like, oh no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna gonna alienate people who's like they treat this as like the, a gospel. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, it's a comic. Neil wrote a comic and it's obviously, a pop, it's got a popularity, it's got a following. We were making a television show of which Neil's voice was hugely important. Um, and I think from what I understand, I, I, I think a lot of, of the sensibilities of the comic come into the show, but I also think inevitably the show's, you know, it's 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 a different medium. I mean, it's it's like the difference yeah. between reading a book and watching a film based upon a book. I mean, it's it's got to have moved in a certain direction. Um, not yeah. saying it's got to be better, worse, or um, it's just it's inevitably going to have, have a different kind of feel to it. Um, and um, but but it was very important for me to kind of just take a moment and and familiarize myself with the source material and kind of re realize what what yeah. uh, find out what the origins of. Yeah, what, what what it was all about. Did that sort of inspire somehow the sound palette you created, or you just you know sat at the keyboards? Okay, you know let's explore some sonic possibilities. I think when I started watching edits, I mean I read the scripts, which are really the scripts are really great. I mean really readable. Sort of, I thought, oh, I want to read another one. I want to read another one. I want to read another. One. Sometimes when you get I've been sent scripts yeah. for for television shows, I kind of read one or two. And I think, okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah, but this was like. <laughs> yeah. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? So um, it was, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would have probably, if that had all been turned into a book, I probably would have just sat there and read it. And I'm not a sort of comic book guy or anything yeah. like that. Um, but, you know, I don't know whether you find the same, but I, I sort of feel that the moment where <clears throat> I feel that I can interact with a project is really when I'm seeing some kind of edited version of, 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 of the picture. Um, because I feel at that point you're seeing a, someone's made some kind of decision about pace, about color, about sound, um, you know, the different disciplines to which we are, you know, another collaborating force. We're starting to see, I mean, those are the things that start to sort of get, get me moving in some kind of direction and up yeah, until that yeah. point, I mean I'm not good sometimes I've been in a situation where people say oh yeah we'll send you the script maybe you know you could do some early on themes I find that very difficult I think the, as you say the emotional response you get from an edit an assembly you know the color the voices the faces like it's so much more powerful for me than just reading a script yeah I, I exactly I mean I sometimes find this I sometimes read the script and then actually sometimes I'll reread the script like I'm watching the show and then I say oh what was actually on the page and sometimes I find a little detail on yeah there. 
um, like sometimes it's just like in brackets, in parentheses, it says something like, you know, it just gives something that you didn't necessarily realize 100% on the screen. It's like, aha, that's quite interesting. I didn't, or you sometimes think they didn't get that. They weren't, they didn't get that on screen. Is that something that perhaps I could help with? That's actually a good point. Cause uh, I think, mean, yeah, just to handle it, because I'm, I, you know, when you say that, I thought maybe they didn't have time or like they changed their mind, but then actually it's a very good idea. To, maybe I can do something with music about that thing. Yeah. I mean, I think people who don't work in the business, they just assume that, you know, that everyone's, everyone got everything they wanted. Like there was tons of money, tons of time. Everyone gave the best performance of their career. The score was brilliant. There was no problems in post-production. I think, the public often assume that there's a like every project happens in this utopian world and anyone who works in yeah. this knows that it's the opposite of that there's never enough time there's never enough money there's always going to be a, somebody says oh we didn't get that scene. we just didn't have enough time for that scene or the actor couldn't do it or there's always pro at least one problematic scene in, in a film or a show um and so i think sometimes that's where the script has come in handy for me is because i've I sort of looked at it, I thought, ah, right, it says that, and I don't see that there. Now, sometimes, of course, it's a conscious decision to go against what the script says, and that's fine, but I've, I've sometimes shot an email to a producer or whatever and say, you know, I was just looking at the scene here, and maybe I'll mention the script, or maybe I won't, maybe I'll try and sound like a clever clog who, who actually just came up with this, you know, amazing concept. I said, Did, didn't we want that bit to be a bit more, oh God, you know, that's, if you could help with that, that'd be amazing because we just didn't get that. We're really, really stuck in the cutting on how to do that. If you could do that for us. And then immediately you've got this kind of goodwill that you're trying to, you know, solve problems, which is a, yeah, a big part yeah, of our job. I, think. I mean, we're, we're as much problem solvers as we are, you know, great, you know, creator of themes and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's I, I need to see picture. I and I need and I okay. I need to see, I need to get an understanding of 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 the world that that's. Yeah, I mean, I would you know I started when I first started to write music. I didn't my first compositional endeavors as embarrassing as they are, but they weren't. They were what loosely might be called concert music. Um, I don't think I could do that anymore. I literally don't think I could write a, a standalone piece of music for a orchestra or a choir or, 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 or something like that. I think I, I think I've now become very much staring at that big screen. All He's, right, okay. That's the think, side I, effect of uh, our profession somehow. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like I. Well, it's not the weirdest thing in the world, is it, to have that attachment? No, to no. Because we, no, of we course are... not. I think even classical composer, you know, like Vivaldi, you know, the four seasons, there's always an element of visual elements amount to it. Like, yeah, true, so... true, true, true. And even, you know, where, you know, my days back in the choir, you know, we were, we, there was this sense that we were accompanying drama. I mean, in churches, there's priests walking around, rituals and all that kind of stuff. And the, and the music is... Uh, it's it's sort of underscoring all that stuff. So, um, I, yeah, but it's just, I just, I, the reason is what sometimes my mum kind of niggles me a little bit. She says, oh, well, what, you know, when are you going to write your opera? When are you going to write your string quartet? And I'm sort of thinking, oh, oh, that's right. like exactly <laughs> like my dad every time. <laughs> hey, when are you going to write a symphony? Well, first, you know, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, but yeah, I don't know. It, it's, uh, I, I, yeah. I, there's a there's a part of me that thinks if you know I'd love to know if I just said I was going to take like a year off or two years or whatever and and I'd love to know I'd love to know if my mindset would change and I think I mean I have got this fantasy of what I do because I I, I found it very difficult since my children to read books I just I, I buy books because I keep thinking I will read them at some point and they just sit on oh, this shelf yeah. taunting uh, me. Uh... Making me yeah. feel like a semi-literate moron who hasn't hasn't picked up a proper book in, in a long time. But I sort of had this idea: I'll read lots of books, I'll listen to lots of music, all sort of, you know, not not film music, but like anything and everything. Yeah. And I don't know, just become like ingrain myself in in the arts. I suppose one of a better word. Um, and then I don't know, maybe that would lead to feeling differently about 
it, being yeah. away from the screen, being away uh, from the computer. And you know, I, I think uh, a point in your favor in comparison, if I wrote a symphony or whatever, you got an audience. I mean, you are a very, very established, well-known composer with fans, a fan base, and you know, hundreds of thousands of listeners on Spotify. So if you release something, people will actually listen. If, you know, me or like someone, like, you know, I'm, I'm making their own way in the industry or whatever, like, okay, probably it was like my relatives. I think that's also, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sounded like what, if I'm writing for myself, fine. But if I write it for people to listen to or like to be performed, I don't know. I think people like in your position, I think would be, I, yeah, I would feel more inspired to write something if I knew mm -hmm. that. You know, it would have like a following. Well, I mean, yeah. Although, I mean, I must say, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be self-facing here or anything. But I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I've still got quite a long way to go on my journey. I mean, I, I feel, you know, I think there's some projects that I've done where I, I haven't, I think they're not very good projects. And I think, um, you know, I think that some of the scores I've written, <laughs> difficult to want to say. I, I think. I sometimes feel that when you work on a sort of, if there's a project, I don't want to name projects here, but this, I can think of some a, a film, for example, that I've done where I just thought this was a pretty shitty film and I wasn't really able to write a particularly great score. I, In fact, I almost found myself having to dumb the music down because I felt that if I, if I tried to make the music as kind of whatever, you know, complicated or... or um, or, or intellectual or, or highbrow, whatever it may be, I felt that I was exposing an even bigger problem. Um, and I, I, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's fair, but that's certainly how I felt. So, you know, I, I, my, I'd say I've got a fairly peppered biography with some, with some, you know, good stuff in there and, and some not so good stuff. I don't think I've ever, I don't, I don't think I've ever written anything that's terrible, but I still think I've got quite a way to go. Um, I think the Sandman is, it's, it's, been unusually nice to me and I have had I don't think I've had any particularly nasty comments I mean I try and I've just like dipped my toe into social media a little bit I, I have <laughs> almost exclusively stayed away from it because I'm I'm a sort of sensitive bastard and I don't like someone sent me a message yesterday they sent it, an email to me and and they said episode six of the Sandman what happened and I'm like, what, what, what the fuck? What did I do? What happened? So I just, I thought, I'm not gonna get. I just sent a question mark back. He goes, oh no, no, just where was it? Where was it on the soundtrack? I really love that music. I just wanted to listen to it. I said, oh, okay, okay. Oh, and then I told him what the track was. And, <laughs> that was so my kind immediate of reply. Right? <laughs> my immediate response was that he, like, he hated it, or oh, like yeah. I done something terrible, I ripped someone off without knowing it, or something like that. And, and, so I don't have. Even though I know, you know, we're all at different stages of careers, and you know, I look at people like John Powell and that, you know, I think, my God, how nice it would be to that be there, and I'm sure there's enough people look at me and think how nice it would be to be there. I mean, that's that's life; it's inevitable. We all have our <clears throat> journeys, and we, yeah. we all have to figure that stuff out. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, going back to what my old agent said about, you know, how one can use social media to really get some traction. I mean, there are people who don't have any sort of profile um, and they have done something good. They created something, whether it's a you know, string quartet or a animation and they've added their music to it or something like that. And they have got it out there and they've used the tools that are frankly the tools that we can no longer avoid. I mean, I, I, I have avoided them, but I, even I think, God, you know, maybe I should be seeing What's Since Hans Zimmer time? joined TikTok, I was like, oh shit. Oh, is he on TikTok now? Oh, wow. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I, I gotta say, I, mean, I, I, I can't force myself to join TikTok. I, I'm leaving that to my children who seem to love it. I, I, I don't get it at all. But a friend of mine the other day, who I haven't spoken to in a long, 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 long time, just mentioned to me that he got some, he'd written a library piece, library track, and it had, um, it had become massive on TikTok. It was like, because I, I said to my kids, I said, do you do you know this track? And I played the first two seconds. I didn't know. And then I played two more seconds. Oh, yeah, that one. 
And he, he says he's waiting wow. for his check. That so far, he says it looks a bit underwhelming, but he says, but but it, something good might be happening. Yeah, that's the, the I think the where everybody wants to you know be on TikTok. It actually establishes new trends like songs, like pop producer and stuff. You know, you know there are a lot of these people dancing on these songs and can go viral like in no time. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, I do. You know, I think a lot of the yeah. norms that govern the past. Um, I mean, I think everything's changing. I, I keep referencing my old agent, which might make you think, why, why the hell did he, I leave him if, I, if he had so many words, <laughs> words of wisdom? He did have words of wisdom. I, I just just didn't always, I say, fall in line with. Yeah, we, yeah. We, weren't, we, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't well matched. But, um, you know, he, he t- reminded me that, like, it's no longer good enough <clears throat> just to send... If you're trying to get some traction, trying to get in, someone interested in you, you can't just send someone like 10 MP3s and think that that's going to yeah. excite someone. You've got to think, what do I do beyond that? What's what's something I can bolt onto that? That's all, ga- you know, that feels natural and like you. It doesn't feel like <clears throat> yeah. you're betraying your um, character. But what can you do to, because we're living in a world where everyone's got access to everything, no one's got any time. And also people's attention spans yeah. are getting shorter and shorter yeah. and shorter. Um, so we need to kind of grab people. And someone sends you a folder and you open up 10 MP3s. I, there's something just inherently a little bit underwhelming about it. Even before you hit play, yeah. it's like, oh, fuck. Sure. Just look at this folder. It's like, oh, God, I'll put that in that thing there. I'll come back to it. And, you know, I do think there's some composers who really excel in being able to captivate people, whether it's their fans whether it's yeah. people who may actually end up employing them. But, you know, people like Brian Tyler, Bear McCreary, you know, yeah, and Hans to a certain extent, Danny. I mean, I think they do their bit with their masterclasses, yeah. but, you know, they're probably, yeah. you know, not not as prolific in that regard. Perhaps, I don't know, I'm not a student of... Hans Zimmer is very active on Instagram, for example. Like, I don't know if he's someone else manages their social media, but... You know, post- oh, Danny Elfman as well. Yeah, and I know I know Hans puts a, the odd Facebook comment on there, and um, well, look, it is the new world. I mean, it, it would it would be a bit like saying, you know, I don't have a. Te- it was almost the point like saying I don't have a telephone, which would just be odd. I don't think I know anyone who doesn't have a telephone, and I do think that the whole social media thing is it's here to stay for better or worse, and I do think. Yeah composers, artists, musicians, whatever, need to figure out how to use it for their benefit that doesn't yeah. damage their mental health. Um, yeah. Because I think that's a big problem. Um, but I do think that means that ultimately there is a there is a world that we, we, one could look at the world that we're living in and, and say that we do have a, a, a means of, of reaching out to people that we didn't 20 years ago. Like yeah. when I, for example, when I started, I, that just, I think Facebook was just in its infancy. I don't think people really took it seriously. Um, so, yeah, I know it can seem for people who don't have any kind of presence and they, they're sort of thinking, how the hell do I get myself heard? Well, but there are, there are ways, uh, mysterious ways to my mind, but um, I, I, yeah. I think it's possible. I think it's possible. And I will test the water because I'm recording this choral music in a couple of weeks. And I, you know, I, I, I will do something with it. I'm not just going to record it and leave it on the hard drive. I will go. So in. it's not for film. It's, uh... No, it's purely, oh, it's, awesome. a, it's, a, it's a vanity project. They're basically pieces I've written over the last couple of decades, some of which I've recorded elsewhere, um, some of which haven't had any sort of performance. And I just thought, Richard said to me, well, I've got the session. Shall we just go like, we just let's go, go back where we started. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's close no, the no, circle. You, exactly. And then you see a kid <laughs> there and then in 10 years or 15 years, hey, David, you remember about me? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that would be my closest to sort of doing something away from the screen. I mean, obviously the music's already written. So although I am, furiously editing it though because some of these pieces were oh, written really? so long ago looking at me oh my yeah. god what's that oh what's that doing oh god that's you're trying to be too clever there so um yeah i'll see how that pans <laughs> out <laughs> oh wow so yeah sorry going back this one briefly to sam and mine in general like i would mm-hmm. think it would be nice to hear about your composing process like you know tv show film is it the same 
So do you suddenly like do you like mm-hmm. uh, create themes first and then put them here and there, or like how, do you, does your approach to films and TV changes? Like how how does it work? Well, I think my approach tends to change on who I'm working for as opposed to what I'm working oh. on. Or oh, what right. medium. interesting. So, for example, I know you know the show that I do called The Good Fight. Um, yeah. I know that the showrunner I work for there, Robert King, he he likes it if I just send him a piece of music and I say, look, I think this could be a good theme for this episode. And I haven't put, so I, that's why I'm slightly contradicting what I've just said because I haven't, because um, I'm sort of doing it away from picture. But you see, he's a unique person I work with because he doesn't really... I say this and it's not entirely true, but he there's an aesthetic that he'd like us to achieve, which is unachievable, which is he would like everything to sound like an independent piece of music that has got nothing to do with the show. It just happens that when it lays in there that this bit happens to hit that moment and that happens, but it's sort of effortless. And it's because this piece of music could exist outside of the show. It, it's not feasible to do that. I mean, it, to, to exclusively do that because of course then I'll do that and he goes so hold on a minute hold on this isn't why aren't you doing this the scene's changed and your music hasn't changed and I said well yeah because you told me to ignore you literally told me to ignore the drama the music should be <laughs> dramatic, dramatically indifferent I wouldn't say that to him because there'd be no point but I, I live in, the, in in that show in this slightly weird world of of like this lofty ambition in terms of what we're going to do musically but then it being sort of inherently contradicted sort of as soon as I've done it. Anyway, I know yeah. I know the deal there. Um with the Sandman, I mean I mean my process there was like I like to do on pretty much anything is start at the piano. Uh okay. which, which I have in a in a different room to all the computers. And I like I like the sort of analog nature of it. I like because the minute I see the computer, I kind of think, well, I can make the cue sound, you know, in the case of the Sandman, kind of 60, 70 percent good enough in here. Then I, I will record orchestra and that will make it, you know, sound. I'm talking about the quality of the music. I'm just talking about the quality yeah. of the production. That will bring it up to close enough to 100 um, percent. So <clears throat> when I get to the sort of if I'm sitting here, I'm thinking very much about delivery schedules and okay. the oh, nut, okay. you know getting the score out of here to my mixer to the orchestrators and the copyists and all that kind of stuff if i'm sitting at the piano i'm not thinking about any of that stuff i'm just thinking about um really kind of nothing else but i'm just trying to write something that that's got some legs that that feels nice that i could just play to someone and say this is a tune whether or not i would send that sketch you know that piano sketch to to someone is I don't think I did on the Sandman. I think I because I didn't know these people because I didn't work with them before. My instinct was that I needed to send it in the framework of the show, and yeah. I've got burnt before, where I know it's now very in vogue to do these kind of suites and and yeah, um, you know, independent from the thing. I know some composers enjoy like doing eight that. minute suites. Yeah. yeah. I did this once and I I, I wrote too much. I wrote th- just shy of 30 minutes um, and none of it to picture. And now I, I'll add, I, ultimately, I think I was just the wrong person for the job. Um, I, I, okay. I don't have a lot. I didn't really understand what they wanted. So I, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't the case of me making excuses. I just wasn't, yeah. I hadn't like, I wasn't in the same wasn't on the same plane as them. So it was, you know, it, it probably just wasn't much could be done there. But what I would say is I could have sold them a much better version of even what I did had I done it to picture because it would have made them, <coughs> excuse me, feel some things because I would have been able to give a surge of emotion here or I could have receded, you know, just come down to something very hovering and tentative and let a dialogue line come through. Um, yeah. Uh, and so for me, it's a two-edged sword, this thing. Um, I, I definitely learned a, a, a harsh lesson there. And I say ultimately it was it was doomed for me and I and I got the boot. Um 
I, I you just have to again it's that reading the room kind of thing knowing who you're working with okay. will they do they need a bit more hand holding like do you, is it better for you to say I wrote this theme here it is at, at five minutes in the in the show or or do you trust do you have a greater kind of musical relationship with with whoever you're sending music to and you can say hey look just I just want to send you a sketch really quick you know I haven't I haven't fleshed it out yet falls back into this message yeah. thing that there is no strict answer to any of this I can see if I, you know personally like, you know if I didn't know director producer I wouldn't be like oh I send you some sketches I'd probably try to maybe impressive I don't know sending like fully fleshed idea first I think the fully fleshed and I also think using the picture because yeah that's that can be if he knows that picture and the minute you add some music to it, you could even add like the worst music possible, but it would, it would, it would interact with the thing that he knows really well. And he wouldn't just be listening to the piece of music, not especially if you haven't made the, the ultimate decision of what you want to do with it, which you can't make that decision until you put it in the film. So you're relying a hell of a lot on them to imagine what you haven't even fully figured out yourself yet. It's dangerous, I think. But but then again, I know Hans, I know Junkie do do, do this, and it's they, you know, they've done really well by it. So I, I think I'd go as far to say I probably wouldn't do that, go down that path again. Um, I don't like it because it again I feel like I'm not I'm not scoring to picture, and I think that's probably what I do best is score to picture. I, yeah. So I noticed also there was uh, quite a lot of electronic stuff in, in the soundtrack. Correct me if I'm wrong. So because uh, yeah, I saw some pictures of you. Maybe it was in in LA. I'm not sure. Really nice studio full of tech stuff. So are you like a fan of tech, virtual instruments, or like? So, um... Yeah, that was so. Yeah, that was my studio in LA. Well, I got <laughs> it's a bit like health fads. Um, you know saying oh I'm going to go and work out or I'm going to be a vegetarian all of these things which I flirted with and um, never been completely consistent with. anyway I went to a, to a buying synth pad like analog synth and stuff, mm. stuff like that and ultimately I just it wasn't for me um, I just found it exhausting even trying to kind of keep it all flowing into my system um, yeah the they look amazing in the room, but seat. then, yeah, probably... Oh, they look bloody fantastic. And the cynic in me tells me that a lot of a, a lot of people who invested in this stuff are doing it for, for the wrong reasons. I certainly was. I was... Oh, I wouldn't say I was doing it to impress anyone. I was doing it slightly because... Well, maybe I was. I mean, I certainly was aware that they looked cool, all the flashing lights. I mean, you know, it's... But the, the big problem for me is I couldn't... I just couldn't find a, a practical way of making them useful for, for me when I'm writing. Whereas, <clears throat> I mean, I know it's Hans's favorite synth in the world and probably everyone else's, but you know, Zebra and Diva, I <clears throat> give me so much kind of pleasure when I'm dealing in, in, that, in that world. And other ones as well, you know, Silent, I really like, Serum. Are they the one you use in the, in the Sandman, for example? Yeah, all, like all, of, the, all of those. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting though, you know, because different people have heard the score in a slightly different way. I mean, a friend of mine, I sent before I sent the soundtrack album out for mastering, I sort of wanted his opinion as to, you know, is, is it too long, too short, or whatever, you know, should I remove this, should I remove that, should I edit it? And and he said, no, 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 well, he did make a few suggestions, all of which I ignored actually. And But his overall comment was, God, man, you know. <laughs> really really like what you've done it's just and you're so lucky to have been able to just write you know a nice um traditional score and i see oh okay that's not, How's that's that not tradition? Really, it doesn't how i wasn't wasn't what my intention was now <clears throat> i certainly wanted it to have orchestra and i certainly wanted the orchestra to be proud and loud and um but i also felt that there was you know not abrasive Kind of non-traditional elements, but I, 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 it's a I think the sound is so unique. Really, I'm not saying this because I'm talking to you, but mm. when I listen, it's like sounds really innovative. This mix of you know choir, brass, strings, this uh, percussion, like the electronic part, the this sort of was like at the beginning, it's like carry on Celeste instrument. Yeah, I don't know. This is the well, mix of this incredible stuff together. Like it's amazing. 
Well, I thank you. I mean, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted it to have, because, I mean, without sounding pretentious about the sort of um, subject matter, but, you know, dreaming, we all dream, or most of us dream. My son tells me he doesn't dream. I don't know what he means by that. But um, but we all, you know, dreaming is a, is a you know, a weird, like, you know, we our mind goes from one thing to another and we slip in and out of, um, you know, different different states and, and so I, you know, I think one of the things that I really wanted to have on this show, I wanted to be able to be, you know, grandiose. And I wanted when we go up, you know, for example, in episode one, when we go and see his, you know, his palace at the, the, at the end yeah. of the first episode, you know, that's a big sweeping moment. But there's also as many, way more moments, which are very small and fragile. And I really wanted to explore that. I. I wanted to know that I really can be triple forte and I can be pianissimo at any given moment in this. And um, that felt really liberating and that I that I had this whole array of things, so both traditional um, and um, and electronic to to play with, <clears throat> to play with. Um, including some some nice patches from 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 your world. Oh really? Well, thanks. We we fine if I may ask. <laughs> um, like if you remember, like some instruments or like uh, if we, if we uh, might say, if we, if it's okay to say it on the, you know social media or something. I mean, it would yeah. be nice. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Just prior to the interview, I I thought I bet I'm going to open my template um, because I I wanted to mention there was a, a patch that I ah, really thanks. like. I can't remember, can't remember the name. Anyway, I've got it right in front of me. Steinberg Activation Manager. No license found. Um, this is Cubase, which I use every bloody day. And oh, just now, right. it's telling me that I don't have a license. No worries, no worries. But, but I, I'll, I'll let you know. There's, there's, there, no, there's uh, definitely thanks, yeah, which, email is fine. And which, you know, which some of which I never replaced because they were exactly as I mm. wanted them to be. I mean, you know, before I start, in terms of palette and template and stuff like that, before I started the Sandman, like before I actually wrote, I kind of trawled through. Well, my orchestral template is sort of, yeah. yeah, it is sort of what it is. I mean, I don't, it's not something I desperately want to change very often because yeah. my hope is that I'm going to replace that in the end in any case. So as long as it's sort of, yeah, one's always looking for that. You want to be able to program it relatively easily. You want it to sound pretty good and the rest can be handled by the live players kind of thing. But all the esoteric stuff, the the sampled stuff, the synths, you know, I would, I probably spend, in this case of the Sam, I probably spent a couple of weeks just combing through things. It's often with the sheer amount of stuff out there now, you sometimes forget yeah, it's crazy. You know, what there is, at, what you've actually owned, what's sitting on a hard drive. And also your tastes change and you might, something that you, you know, you bought a library and <clears throat> you kind of played through the stuff and you go, oh, well, um, you know, I don't, I don't need that right now because you're working on something that might be, you know, and then you listen to it again six months later, and you think, Jesus, that's a really great sound. I'd love to, you know, get that loaded and start playing around with that. And what I do with all that stuff, so like st the stuff I use from, 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 from your libraries, is I load that all locally. Um, I don't want that anywhere near the templates. I used to put stuff in a template, but but um, all my orchestras in a template, but all the sort of non-traditional stuff that I use is all okay, loaded yeah. locally so I can... I, it's, you know, everything's got its own channel, so I feel I can do pretty much anything I want to it, um, yeah. rather than it's coming out of like a, you know, a strings bus, then it's bloody yeah. complicated, you know. Um, and then also, you know, with this project, I did, there's a number of instrumentalists that I work with, well, Richard, who, well, I was about to say Richard, who does more traditional stuff, but we did, we did some really interesting, he can't play the double bass, but he has a double bass and we did some really interesting stuff on that um probably interesting because he can't play it um, yeah. <laughs> uh and you know lots of other in well not lots but a number of instrumentalists that i've worked with who play either traditional instruments in untraditional ways or or they sort of amp sort of have an amplified version of their instrument going through even tides and and guitar pedals so they're already bringing yeah. some kind of unique sensibility which i'll take you know, a step further when it comes in, into my system. So, yeah, I mean, this score definitely was, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess someone might say it's a hybrid score. I, I'm not desperately in love with that word because to me, I sort of feel that means sort of absolutely sort of manic, 
sort of action percussion and sh and sort of brass sort mm. of I I I wanted it like one thing I wanted to be able to do was use woodwinds and have synths at the same time as woodwinds because woodwinds are so forbidden now in modern film scoring. Gosh, isn't that true? Like yeah. people think that, like oh no woodwinds it, you're you're being too this do that do the other. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm. I was just, I mean, if I could tick one box on this show, it was that I could use an alto flute and I could also have, you know, some weird kind of synth delay patch going on at the same time. Um, and I wanted a lot of the sound design elements to be kind of, I wanted some of them to feel like almost felt rather than heard, that they're kind of just lurking, they're just shimmering yeah. around the top, spinning, like this weird kind of extra layer of slight offness. Um, of course, there's moments where they're more, more prominent, but there, I would say there's barely a moment where there isn't some kind of non-traditional thing lurking beneath the surface mm. at the same time as the orchestra, which is why when my mate said, yeah, it's a great traditional score, I was like, ah, okay, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> yeah, so, right. Uh, not exactly <laughs> what I wanted to hear about, thank you. <laughs> so you said it's like uh, lurking here, like, do you work in 5.1? like when you work I don't I don't um I knew I was going to be delivering this in stereo um all oh, right and, is that the delivery yeah. for Netflix usually stereo I think I don't know actually I've done a number of Netflix now shows now and it has all been stereo I don't know if that's a hard and fast well, mm. I don't think it can be because I know someone else who mixes some Netflix stuff and he told me he does it all in 5-1 I've just never been a 5-1 guy I have I have I've got three surround speakers there well left right back and then center yeah i suppose it's not something i gravitate towards because if i'm cutting an album which you know one would like to think that's a possibility that at the end of a show or film that there'd be a soundtrack album it's obviously you're in stereo at that point um so <laughs> rather selfishly even though we're not paid to make soundtrack albums i have i do have a thought that yeah, obviously there are matrix that can can bring everything that's five or one down into stereo. So it's not it's not like a big problem, but I don't know. It's just not ever something that's kind of I felt passionate about or desperate to maintain. Do you, yeah. I mean, do you use a five one No, no, I don't. Um, no. I know, like you know, like yeah, I don't I actually. I just leave a stereo and the mixer. Like I did a. The pilot for a TV series some time ago, and they I know they delivered in 5.1, but what I sent was stereo. Yeah, I mean that's I there's also a part of me that thinks at the, on when it gets to the stage, whether it's for a show or a movie, someone's gonna have to make some big decisions about the sonic yeah. <clears throat> arena. And that's gonna be what how much music is coming out of the surrounds, how much sound effect, you know, all that stuff. And in yeah. a sense, why not just let them make? I mean, I suppose. If you were, I don't know, I suppose if you were recording, the thing is, you know, I recorded on this score, I recorded everything in so many different places. So the brass and woodwinds were either in Air Studios, Abbey Road, or mm. Synchron Stage um, in Vienna. All right. Strings were all done in Hungary, in Budapest, in a room that basically has no reverb whatsoever. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Um, overdubs done in people's studios here, there, and anywhere with their own, you know, size of rooms, but yeah, yeah. so lots of different places yeah like, yeah. yeah so when my mix and the choir was done in uh uh god i always forget where george devros's company is um sophia oh, right yeah sophia yeah i think so yeah. yeah i did some choir there i did some choir in london um i think yeah and then musicians yeah so my mixer when he got all the elements so he got all my synth pre-records and everything <clears throat> and then he, and then he was just basically grabbing these Pro Tools sessions from around the world and wow. presumably cursing my name. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, he had to obviously rationalize the, the world and make sure that it was all, you know, fitting into one space. And, and so I think I feel the same with a sort of re-recording mix on a dub stage. I would rather let them if they want to feed any of that into the surround yeah yeah definitely yeah, I, yeah I think I it for want... us it adds another layer of you know complexity in our work and delivery there that's the way i see it yeah and i don't i mean i don't really load 
I've got two VE Pros, but they're laptops. They're bloody good, actually. Um, 128 gigs on each. So 256, I could lo keep loaded in the template. But uh, so I could load everything I want to on. I've still got a lot of headroom if I want to load more. But that would all change if I, if I started adding multi mics. I'd start, you know, burning up loads more RAM. Um, I just don't think, I, I, I just don't think it gives me enough back to, to, to warrant it. And especially, maybe I think differently if I was having directors in my studio all the time, but those days are over now. In any case, directors, no one's going to come be seeing me anytime soon. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, um, so it'd be, it would be more an exercise in self, well, in, in flat, like, think, oh my God, listen to that music coming out of the back. I mean, yeah, I'm 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 fine with it coming from the front. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I wanted to ask you, like, um, could probably you won't be able, but like, could you tell us, uh, you know, who's watching, like, what you're working on at the moment? So what yeah, can we I can expect? tell you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, it was quite not because sometimes I'm asked that question and and I I I can't either because because I don't know for sure that I've got the job and I I don't want to curse myself for saying it. Uh, or, or for perhaps other reasons I can't quite, quite think of, but I literally have um, two jobs on the go, which are um, the the final season of The Good Fight that we were talking about earlier, which um, which is the sequel of The Good Wife, which is the sequel right? of yeah. The Good Wife. Yeah, so I'm just um, oh, yeah. sort of marching forward on on that, and then um, and then this movie called Kandahar, which is um, Gerard Butler again. Um, and with the and with the so I've done two films with Gerald Butler, Angel Has Fallen, and Greenland. And yeah, that was quite recent, isn't it? Greenland. Greenland was during the pandemic. Yeah, so a couple of years or so ago. Um, mm. it's, you know, it's a good. It's a you know we've seen this sort of story before about an astro asteroid or comet hitting the Earth and what happens. But I I, I like the director Rick because he tries to keep it. Like he doesn't shy. He knows that we need action because people like action. Like, huge... There's Jared Butler, you know, <laughs> this shit is going to happen. I think Rick has brought out from Jared some really interesting performances, and I think Kandahar will be another one where it's like it, I think Jared's allowed to do things that perhaps some of his you know other movies, which are just sort of more straight up action. I think these, I think Rick sort of opened. I'm not, yeah, I'm sure Jared's, I'm, I'm not, I'm watching every film he's ever made, but I, I do feel that this is a bit more, they've got a few, a few more dimensions to it. But this score, so it's set in the Middle East, but I'm not kind of going to a Middle Eastern place at all, um, or hardly at all. I'm keeping it very, it's very ambient, very um, sort of atmospheric, sparse, um, no orchestra, he doesn't want any orchestra. Um, all right. Because also so I was listening a bit to, um, the previous film with uh, Gerard Butler, and it was, it felt like a, a bit ambient also with guitars. Is like yeah, sort of, a... guitar. and I had, but I had quite a bit of choir in that as well, though. Um, oh, there was all right. these quite choir boy tracks in in there as well. Can't seems I can't really escape from choirs it's, it's always <laughs> like lurking around me. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Rick, Rick, the director, he likes. Um, or he he doesn't like things to be sort of too Hollywood or too mm. um, too bombastic. If, if we can pull back and still let the audience enjoy it, he feels good. And he he gets very worried about if we if we push too hard and if we um, if we if we like bombast, he doesn't he doesn't he, he tends yeah. to want, want us to shy away from. I mean, I don't know. We'll see. There's a month to. To get it done. I mean, I've got, I've written quite a lot of music, but you got just... only a month to score the feature. Well, no, I've already, I've written uh, over fifty. I've probably written about sixty percent of it, but it's all oh. they've been, they've been testing it, um, <clears throat> getting direct, uh, sorry, producer notes and stuff like that. So I think tomorrow I'm getting locked picture, and then basically I've got a month to to, to finish. The bit I'm into and things. how do you do like you know with you got so many things going on with work-life balance and family like do you do you, do you feel like you have a good work-life balance like uh, no I, i'm trying to get better at it but I, I don't feel like i do um you know i don't have an assistant um so i'm, I'm sort of so everybody's watching like his email is on the website <laughs> 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 
Well, if there's anyone in southwest England uh, where I live who's who'd be interested, but but the problem is I'm not looking for a writing assistant. Someone that's the thing I think most people would like, you know, everything well, assistant, but then actually it's more like technical things that you need. The, the you know, resyncing like, cues, maybe. Well, yeah, you know, resyncing, yeah, exactly. I mean, last night <laughs> I had to because I've just moved to this new studio, I had to put in in one of my machines, a new graphics card, which I, I can do. I'm not I'm not too proud or my time isn't so precious that I can't, what I assume would take 45 minutes to do. I put it in, <laughs> all hell broke loose. Everything stopped working. Like, the, never mind the graphics, like fucking Pro Tools stopped working. Yeah, um, the Motu, inter all the interfaces, everything just, and so from five o'clock yesterday evening, to 1.30 this morning, I was on my, I do have a sort of tech guru in LA. He's a friend of mine who I don't think he likes doing. I'm pretty sure he just sent me a text during this. Pretty sure he's going to say something like, that's the last you're ever gonna, time you're ever going to get from me. Oh um, but um, we, he was able to do it online and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, I think I, it would be better for me, especially as I, you know, descend more and more into middle age to, to, to free up some time to, Things that I just don't shouldn't be doing. I don't need to be putting graphics cards yeah, in. Yeah. I, I, I'm in the fortunate position. I, I can pay for someone else to do that. Um, I don't, you know, even like printing cues, I tend to do myself, but that's because oh, I'm a bit isn't of Isn't that the most boring thing in the world? I, you'll know, only you will know if it, you know, if that, for some reason, if that echo boy has stopped working, so the delay isn't there. Uh, or or if there's some weird glitch or something in, uh, or no stops playing or whatever. I like, I wrote it, so I'm going to know it. Um, so I, I'm somehow I need to get a bit better at that. As the conf even the conforming of cues, you know, when when they hacked up the picture and everything's all messed up. I mean, I know that's often a job that goes to an assistant, but even that requires sort of creative decisions to some extent. Um, you have to say, oh, well, I used to hit that moment. I can't hit that moment anymore. What should I do? I mean, I feel quite passionately that it's that's my job you know I'm, I don't I, I it seems odd to me to delegate that but of course I understand from a sort of time perspective I mean I suppose I mean my doctor once was quite clear that I need to take a day off a week a week um yeah. she said, you can't carry on like this and I try to but then but then I sort of think okay Sunday day off well there we go eight hours on a graphics card or I'll, or I'll sort of be we'll watch a movie with the kids or something and I'll have the laptop because I use it as a moment to kind of send so it's I I'm not very good at turning off no I'm not yeah. and and I feel I absolutely need to be both for the benefit of myself but for more importantly, of my family, who, who yeah, know. yeah, for sure, that's a very good point. I think. Uh, I mean, it's understandable sometimes. You know, you got you know, you got to deliver the music, and there's especially TV, in TV series, you know, time schedule is so tightly packed. You can't really escape. But as you say, I think yeah, giving us time for ourselves, you know, to you know, for whatever you know, work or family time, playing with the children. I think, yeah, something to look forward to. You have to consider this. And I also think, and I'm very good at talking about this, not necessarily always actioning it myself, but, you know, do, do does everything that we come up with creatively happen when we're sat in front of our screen next to our keyboard? No, I don't think. I, I, I think that's where we have to execute it. But yeah, I think anything that's led us to be the musicians that we are has happened it, here, there, and anywhere. It happens in a restaurant. It happens in a, <clears throat> you know, having a walk with a friend you haven't seen for a long time and a, and a catch up. It happens in an argument with someone. It happens in a, um, you know, phoning your mom and having a conversation or, or your dad saying you need to write a symphony. That, those things, or reading a book, write, reading a poem, writing a book, whatever, those things I think are all part of the creative process for, for any person who in, invents things um and i don't so therefore i'm not saying you know therefore some we should all spend lots of times in rest or we should go to a restaurant for every lunch and dinner but i am yeah. saying that, that i think we would benefit enormously from making sure we keep interacting with the world around us and 
and all the variety of feelings that that provides to us. Because I think you hear things, both musical and non-musical, and I think that that it, it, it becomes part of our kind of who we are as, as as creators. So, you know, stepping out, not thinking. I certainly remember when I lived in LA, the a sense that you know being in the studio was where it had to be. You know, you kind of had to be there all the time. And if you weren't, then you weren't yeah. kind of weren't as good as the next person who was there all the time. Now, none of this is about trying to duck away from hard work and, and putting the hours in and delivering the product, but it is thinking, how do I keep sane? How do I keep fresh, both physically and, and musically? Yeah, um, yeah. And, I, and I do think it's important to factor that in as well. And especially if it can involve your, your family if you have one um then that, that's e e even better yeah these these are questions that i i mean frankly one of my decisions to our decisions to move away from la was based on 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 this sort of thing okay yeah i sort of guessed it like, was probably like yeah it, it, it was, in the it direction was sort of, maybe yeah it was sort of feeling what what is what is you know what what is this thing this what what is my life you know what what, what am i and you know i would much I'd much rather sort of when I'm gone and if I have a gravestone or something or, or service, but I'd much rather be rem remembered as being a foremost, primarily as being a human being and anything I may have achieved in music or anything else to me is secondary. It's bloody important, but it's not the most important thing. Is I know. I want to say like, do you see like um, on that matter, like in a way, like do you see yourself working, you know, to like John Williams, like with like 93 or like you say, you know, I have enough now saved up to support my family. I, you know, travel with my wife. I don't know. I enjoy your life. I still feel that I haven't quite found my niche. And I do, but in a way, I do feel the Sandman might be a good stepping stone towards it. Um, you know, there's other things I've done which are like fine and that they've paid the bills and they've been good. And, yeah. you know, this, I feel like, I'm not normally someone who would stand up and sort of say, oh, I really love this score. I really, and I'm not even going to say about Salmon, but I do feel sort of a connection with it in a way that I perhaps haven't done with some of my other stuff. Um, so I still feel I've got, I've got to invest in okay. that a little bit more yeah. and see where that might lead me. Now look, it, there's a chance it may not lead me much further along any path. And I am in a relatively good position where I, I don't, I don't have to take on this. I don't have to take on that. Um, I can I can afford to relax a little bit, but of course it would pose the question that you know would I want to just stop you know hang up and 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 stop stop doing and no I think I think in an ideal world I just keep trying to you know find my musical personality find find my voice which I I think is a I don't I think it's an eternal quest that you know. I don't, I don't yeah, yeah and changes with us growing and changes up. with time yeah yeah and I think to keep discovering that is kind of fascinating and um I just think if I can if, if there's if I can do it in a slightly more mellow and relaxed way and perhaps slightly more healthy way <laughs> <laughs> then I'd yeah. be then then I consider myself very fortunate I don't look at like when I see the latest sort of speed blockbuster franchise i don't think god i want to be doing that why can't i do that i don't i, really, I just feel yeah. if i can find stuff that feels good and i can connect with and obviously you know yeah. you want to, you, no one sort of turns around and say you know don't, don't worry about paying of course one still wants to earn money and stuff like that but um but i do if i, I could put a bit more emphasis on things that actually make me enthusiastic and i, I feel i've done a lot of um you know, cranking it out and just, you know, looking at a cue list and thinking, oh my God, I've got to get through all of this. And um, I, yeah, if I, yes, I would definitely like to address the balance and geez, you know, I don't know, I don't know what John Williams, I'd love to know what, what his uh, daily routine consists of, but um, I, yeah, I, for me, a perfect existence would be being able to do this, but with a little bit more about me saying, yeah. Yes, that sounds really interesting. No, not interested. Thank you. And actually, you know what? November, we planned a trip to Spain or whatever. And being able to actually do that properly, not as you said before, with bloody yeah. hard hanging out of your, yeah, your yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which I've done. You know, we've 
you've done it, I've done it. I mean, and it's and it's it's part of the the, yeah. the rit- part of the rite of passage. But it'd be nice to think at some point wow. I could go on holiday and it would just <laughs> yeah. be my swimming trunks and suntan lotion. <laughs> <laughs> well, after December, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you always get calls about jobs every day, but I can imagine now <laughs> getting offers from everybody. Now. Well, well, so far, I mean, it has so far, not really. I mean, I've had nice compliments and my agents assured me that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be busy, but no, no, nothing, nothing yet. But that's OK. That's OK. I'm, 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 I'll finish off what I've got. And, um, yeah. and it, frankly, if I finish this off, these two projects, which would be take me to about middle of October. If it were like, Dave, there's a, something and it's going to start in January, I'd say, yeah, let's take it and do not call me for the next two and a half months because I would absolutely yeah. love that. I haven't, you know, I've been yeah. back here a couple of weeks. I can't, I, I wanted to go to the premiere of the Sandman, which was in London, Sandman, which is in London, and I just couldn't make it because, well, A, we'd literally just got here two days before, but I had to get some music out for the film I'm doing. So I thought, oh, I've got to turn parents. So I'd love to come to London. I could come meet you and hang out and, you know, do things. Um, so, yeah, I, time off sounds like a very nice thing right now. Yeah, well, I hope you, uh, I hope you get it because, it, yeah, it sounds like an important thing. But, yeah, I, I, I ask you actually, you know, all the question I prepared and, I want to really thank you so much because I think it was such a, honestly, a really, really good conversation. I mean, so many points touched and I'm, I'm sure lots of people were really, really inspired by, by whatever, oh, all w- what you said, really. Oh, well, I'm, I, I would like, well, that's kind of you say, and I will, I, when I can get this bloody thing working, which probably just requires a reboot, I'll, I'll, um, I'll let you know what I'm, what I'm delving into. <laughs> all right. Thanks, thanks again. Speak soon. Well, uh, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.